Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm very excited to be here uh, to present this talk to you. Um, so uh, as we said, um, today I'm here to show you a talk uh, of uh, research that we have done internally in uh, Oligo. Uh, we call it Discovering Shadow Vulnerabilities in Popular Open Source Packages. Um, so first of all, I'll present myself. So uh, my name is Guy Kaplan. I'm a senior security researcher for uh, Oligo Security. Yeah, I have more than a decade of uh, experience with uh, software development and, um, and uh, vulnerability research. Uh, and also, I am a scuba instructor, so uh, if someone wants to dive uh, deep into the tech or, uh, or into the waters, so uh, you can come with me. <laughs> uh, in addition to that, I also want to uh, note that uh, Gal Elbaz uh, was supposed to be here with us, uh, our co-founder and CTO. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the complex situation in Israel, uh, he couldn't come. <coughs> okay, so... Uh, you might all already be familiar with the concept of sh uh, shadow IT, which are uh, actually devices that you have on your network but are not monitored by the central IT department. And therefore, they usually present a, a great risk since you can't monitor them or uh, comply uh, like to, to security uh, uh, restrictions. Or maybe shadow APIs, which are actually APIs that you have on your application uh, that are that came from some third-party application, and again, you're not aware of them, and therefore you cannot uh, control and monitor the usage of uh, these APIs. Uh, and in the same uh, manner, sh uh, shadow data and shadow SaaS. Uh, what all of these have in common is that they are all something that the organization have, but uh, they are not aware of them having uh, having them, and therefore they possess uh, a really uh, high risk to the organization. So today we want to coin a new term, which we call shadow vulnerabilities. Uh, so what are those uh, shadow vulnerabilities? So basically, shadow vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities that uh, actually don't have a CV assigned. Uh, they usually take the form of uh, security uh, security vulnerabilities, who uh, are the cause of them is just uh, simply not following security best practices by the open source package. Uh, and they're, uh, they're usually known to the maintainers, but they're just flagged as a no-fix. So they, they're different from zero days by that that they're intended, like this is what the maintainers meant to do, but they just lead to uh, security flaws. Uh, this fact actually makes them uh, the libraries which has them uh, vulnerable by design. Uh, so to show you an example of such a shadow vulnerability, I want to present a library which is called uh, Snake YAML. So Snake YAML is a famous open source library for parsing YAML files in Java. Uh, it is ranked number one uh, YAML parser in the Maven repository and is itself a dependency for more than uh, 4,000 uh, other open source packages. And just to recap, this is a YAML file. It is meant to be similar to a JSON file, just more uh, human readable. Uh, if you find that readable as a human. <coughs> so let's say you're a Java developer. Uh, I am myself a Java developer sometimes. Uh, not particularly uh, proud of that, but sometimes I am. Uh, so let's say you want to deserialize a YAML file. Uh, what most developers will do, they will just try to Google the issue, and they will just go to the first uh, example that has like a code snippet that they can just like copy and paste, because this is usually what we do. Uh, and once they will see this uh, snippet, it's from the uh, Snake YAML the documentation, they will just try to copy it, paste it to their code, and uh, run it. And it works. Uh, at this point, what most people will do, they will just close the documentation and continue on with their day. After all, they have uh, many more missions that they need to accomplish. And there is no reason to think that by doing that, you did something wrong. But if one digs a bit further into the documentation, he will see this. Snake YAML allows you to construct a Java object of any type. So what is uh, any type? Any type can be a string, an array, a hash map, sorry. And it can even be this uh, 
uh, custom object, like this person class here. So if you will try to uh, parse this uh, YAML, it will uh, uh, lead to calling the constructor for the person class. But wait, any type? This is something that should really make your uh, hacker spidey sense tingle. Can it even be a URL class loader? So just to recap, a URL class loader is a special Java class that is uh, meant to, uh, it allows you to load uh, Java classes from remote locations over the internet. Uh, and essentially it can lead to remote code execution. So apparently yes, uh, if you will try to parse this uh, YAML uh, payload in Snake YAML, uh, it will result in code execution uh, and it will run attacker controlled code uh, from this uh, attacker domain here. And uh, I guess you wouldn't expect that just by parsing a YAML file, you can lead to code execution. Uh, basically, a YAML file is just a text file. Uh, and uh, it's important to note that uh, expected behavior is something that is really important in security since uh, basically a vulnerability is an unexpected behavior. So if a developer uh, expects something, so uh, if, uh, if you do something that the developer did, didn't expect to do, it can really lead to devastating results. Uh, so we weren't the only ones who thought that this behavior is uh, pretty weird. Uh, so this issue was uh, tried to be uh, reported uh, quite a while ago. Uh, and uh, as a response, the maintainer just said that uh, he, he's not planning to fix this because he doesn't consider this a vulnerability. <coughs> Basically, what the maintainer said is that this was why he wrote this library. He, he meant for it to be able to create random Java objects. And he also said that uh, if you don't want to be vulnerable to this, the migration path is simple. You can just use the safe constructor. So what is a safe constructor? Uh, so basically, uh, Snake YAML allows you to provide custom constructor types to control the way that you create uh, objects based on YAML files. So for example, you do have the safe constructor. Uh, so the safe constructor is basically a constructor that just allows uh, to parse primitive Java, ty uh, Java types, such as a null, a bool, int, and stuff like that. And you can see here that uh, once uh, the safe constructor uh, sees uh, a, a tag that, is, that it does not know, it will uh, throw an undefined constructor exception. In addition to the safe constructor, there is the regular constructor, which is just named a constructor. Uh, so the regular constructor is very, uh, very similar to the safe constructor, but uh, uh, it differs by that, uh, that if it sees an unknown tag, it will just try to parse, to, to find like any class that satisfies, satisfies this tag. Uh, in addition to that, the regular constructor is, uh, is the default constructor. So if you'll just try to initialize a new YAML object, uh, you will get the regular constructor. <coughs> and uh, in addition to that, uh, the, uh, it, because of what I said that uh, the, the safe constructor and the constructor are very similar, uh, it led the maintainer to do a design choice uh, that can really lead to uh, unexpected, uh, unexpected behavior here because uh, the constructor type actually inherits safe constructor, which actually allows you to do uh, this code snippet here. Uh, so you can actually create a variable of type safe constructor and put a constructor uh, object inside. Uh, so it can lead developers to a false sense of safety uh, by thinking they're using, they're using the safe constructor while they're actually using the constructor. So not that safe. Uh, so is this behavior a vulnerability or not? So you might as well say, this isn't a vulnerability because as the maintainer says, uh, this is the expected behavior. He meant for the constructor to be able to create types. Uh, but, and uh, therefore you, you also don't have a CVE. 
But I think it's important to, to note that the very reason that uh, why we issue CVs in the first place is to uh, alert users who are using open source libraries that by using this open source library, you expose yourself to certain risks. And we think that uh, this, risk, uh, this uh, behavior led to so many other vulnerabilities in uh, th stuff that depend on a safe, uh, on a snake YAML that we might as well call this uh, shadow vulnerability. But anyway, any, any of this doesn't matter, since as the maintainer says, 100% of the applications which use Snake YAML uh, do not parse data from untrusted, user, uh, untrusted sources. We decided to test this claim. So to do so, uh, we've started doing what we call uh, reverse fuzzing. So basically, if uh, traditional fuzzing involves taking uh, one target and trying to throw as many inputs at it, uh, trying to see when it breaks, uh, reverse fuzzing is the method of taking one vulnerable code pattern uh, and trying to throw it at as many targets as you can, trying to see which one breaks. So to do that, we had to start finding uh, relevant targets to uh, try and attack and see which one is vulnerable. Uh, so we started with the simplest thing of just uh, searching for uh, this uh, code in GitHub. <coughs> and we found a lot of possible targets, but it also contained a lot of noise. So we had to filter it and uh, we wanted to find like a popular projects. So we tried to filter by the amount of stars that the project has, but uh, unfortunately the GitHub uh, code search doesn't let us do that. So we did have to uh, write our own uh, query code uh, to do that, and we ran it for a couple of hours. Then we got uh, a lot of results, uh, and out of all these results, we also had to filter out projects that uh, some of them did use Snake YAML, but only for uh, creating YAML files and not parsing them. And uh, and some were also using the safe constructor. So to do that, we had to use uh, CodeQL. So uh, CodeQL is basically uh, like a very complex uh, code querying language that allows you to do uh, complex queries on the code. Um, so by using these methods, we were able to uh, find a few prime targets, which we began uh, exploring. So uh, one of the targets that we found was Apache Cassandra. So Apache Cassandra is uh, an open source distributed uh, database. It is very popular. Uh, a lot of uh, big, big organizations uh, are using Apache Cassandra. So basically, Apache Cassandra is using Snake YAML to parse a file which is called uh, Cassandra YAML. Uh, basically, there is this file which is used to configure the uh, Cassandra instance. Uh, and what we found that if an attacker can control the data of this configuration file, he can actually lead to remote code execution. Sorry, to code execution, not remote. Uh, and what we try to do is to find a, a valid attack vector that can uh, that we can use to uh, edit this file somehow. Uh, so the first thing that we found uh, was that uh, this configuration file uh, on the default Docker image uh, was actually writable by all users. So by using this vulnerability, we actually could uh, obtain local privilege escalation because we could uh, just uh, edit this file through an other user and then uh, escalate our privileges to the Cassandra database user. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, during our research, we happened to find another vulnerability which led us to um, being able to write files to the disk and then we could edit this file, and again, uh, it uh, led to a persistent uh, code execution capability. Uh, so we did uh, try to report this vulnerability to, the, uh, to Apache, uh, and they were uh, really uh, responsive, and they uh, immediately tried to uh, mitigate this issue. Uh, but they did reply that they, they, they do see that there is a problem, but they just don't consider it a vulnerability uh, because of the attack vector. Uh, but they said that they do want to, to change the code to actually use the safe constructor. 
Uh, but then, unfortunately, they fell into the exact same pit hole that, we, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they, they just changed the, the name of the type to safe constructor, thinking that this will cause the, the software to use the safe constructor. Uh, we we uh, send them another message that telling that uh, uh, the fix uh, is incomplete, but uh, this was still left uh, unfixed. Um, so so here it's important to note that uh, the the very fact that it is not fixed yet and it does not have a CV uh, is actually creating another shadow vulnerability here, uh, because you have like uh, something which is seen vulnerable by the same uh, uh, vulnerability, but uh, they still don't agree that it is a valid vulnerability to get a CV, even though that you do have some attack vectors that you can use here. <coughs> so why, uh, while uh, LPE is uh, really cool, local privilege escalation, uh, what we really wanted to find is a remote code execution, which is uh, way cooler. So uh, to do that, we had to expand the amount of targets that we're using, uh, that we're trying to find. And, uh, and also we wanted to find targets um, that are not using Snake YAML only for configuration because we wanted to find like a better attack vector. Um, so to do that, we had to change the methods that we're using to search the targets. So first of all, we moved to search, uh, searching from uh, Docker Hub, so we could find also projects that are, that, are, that are not open source. And the idea was basically to trace them at runtime and uh, try to filter out the ones that are using Snake YAML uh, not only for configuration. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to find the ones that are not using Snake YAML only at the beginning. And so to do that, uh, we had to find a way to trace them uh, at runtime. And uh, luckily, this is exactly what we at Oligo do. We use the uh, eBPF technology to observe the runtime behavior of, uh, of open source libraries uh, down to the function level. And we also do that at scale. So using the data that we have collected from uh, seeing thousands of images running, we were able to create uh, like a graph uh, of a uh, usage of uh, the snake YAML, uh, <coughs> the snake YAML functions over time. So this is an example of a uh, of a graph of uh, of an application which is using snake YAML only for configuration. Configuration. So you can see here that the that you're uh, calling the the snake YAML only in the beginning, and here you could. You can also see, um, you can see the call graph for uh, function. For like, uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah. So, so here you can see the call graph for uh, what happens when you call uh, Snake YAML also in the runtime. And using this method, we were able uh, to find the uh, confluence. Okay, so basically Confluence, uh, they use uh, Snake YAML uh, using, a, using a library which is, which is called Liquibase. So you can, you can see here that uh, just by, uh, th they have like a connection stream and they just uh, forward the uh, request that they get into the Snake YAML. So uh, during our research, uh, this was actually uh, fixed by the Confluence uh, uh, team. Um, but it was not fixed as a security update. They just uh, updated the, the software. Uh, so the last one that uh, we found here was a uh, PyTorch. So uh, PyTorch uh, has like a server which is called a torch server. So we found that uh, TorchServe is also using this uh, Snake YAML library. Uh, and we ended up uh, doing our research finding uh, a lot of vulnerabilities uh, in the PyTorch <coughs> Sorry. In the PyTorch server. 
So basically, um, PyTorch models are uh, represented in this uh, YAML, uh, YAML type. So as you can see here. Uh, and what we found is that uh, <laughs> a torch serve is also using snake YAML uh, in like uh, it is using the default constructor and not the safe constructor. Uh, we found it in a couple of places. So we found that uh, if you try to upload a model like this, uh, it will result in a, in a code execution using a attacker controlled code. In addition to that, we found multiple vulnerabilities in uh, TorchServe that actually led us to uh, being able to uh, gain control over remote uh, instances of uh, TorchServe uh, just by using this uh, simple command. Uh, this was also uh, got a very wide uh, coverage. Uh, we called it a shell torch. And this was uh, fixed uh, in uh, August uh, on uh, version uh, 0.8.2. So uh, these were just a couple of examples of projects that were using uh, Snake YAML in a vulnerable way. Uh, but it's important to note that uh, we we found many other uh, many other projects who use uh, Snake YAML in the in the same way. Uh, and this vulnerability was like a gold mine for us. Uh, it seems like uh, everywhere we looked, we just find flawed usages of, uh, of Snake YAML. So I guess that now you would agree that uh, we do need a CVE for flaws like this. Uh, and we weren't the only ones who thought like that. Uh, Google also saw these uh, flaws. And uh, they, they also said like that, uh, we need a CVE for this, and uh, Google, being a CNI, just like issued a CVE without uh, without any. Uh, they didn't need approval from anyone. <coughs> so uh, it did got a CVE. It got a nine point eight. And basically, after they got the CVE, so um, it started showing up in all the databases and. Uh, People came to the project maintainer and then say, like, we need a fix for this. Uh, so together with uh, Google and the project maintainer, they uh, deployed Snake Camel 2.0. Uh, but again, the maintainer didn't really uh, agree that this is a flaw that you need to fix. So uh, today, if you go to Snake Camel uh, main page, uh, you will see this. It basically says, uh, if you are here because of a uh, of a vulnerability report, uh, it is most uh, most probably a false positive. <coughs> so you can also see that uh, this is an example from the tools that uh, uh, Cassandra is using. So it did uh, they did uh, mark it as uh, false positive, uh, while we actually showed that they, they are vulnerable. <coughs> uh, so who, who owns the responsibility here? So I think it's important to say that the Snake YAML maintainer and other open source maintainers, uh, they're actually, they don't owe anything to you. They just uh, wrote some amazing code and then deployed it and gave it to everyone. Uh, and uh, you can't really come with uh, complaints to, to, to the code that they gave you. Um, but uh, but 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 you also have the project maintainers, which expect uh, uh, that people uh, who wrote these uh, open source packages uh, will give them uh, quality code, which is uh, security tested. And in the end, the users are the ones who are being left uh, vulnerable. So uh, this was like a vulnerability that we found that it did end up getting a CV, so it was like a overshadowed. Uh, or unshadowed, uh, but uh, it was just a tip of the iceberg uh, because we found uh, similar patterns in um, in many more uh, uh, packages. So I won't go to each one of them, but uh, we did have a lot. And uh, we also heard that uh, you have to do like an uh, exploit uh, in every talk, so we also have an exploit for you.
So you can see here on the bottom terminal, there's a, the Apache Cassandra server. And on the top, it's the attacker's terminal. So you can see it's uh, running the exploit. And once it's done, you can see it gets a uh, reverse shell to the Cassandra uh, database. You can applaud now. <laughs> Okay, so for conclusion, uh, we really like open source. We think open source is very, very awesome. Um, we think it's really the best way to develop software today. Um, but we also think that uh, when you want to use open source, you need to do that in a safe way. And just fixing CVEs is not enough. Uh, we, we think there, there, there needs to, uh, to be more work that you do uh, when you want to use open source in a safe way. And we, we also think that uh, people should be aware of the risks like this. Uh, so not only fixing CVEs uh, can be the only solution to these uh, problems. Uh, we also think that this is a community effort. Uh, we're really happy to be a part of the open source community. And uh, we think we need the help of uh, the whole community uh, to to help make the uh, open source packages that we use uh, more secure. So uh, thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure being here. Um, you can find us on uh, LinkedIn or uh, Twitter or X or whatever. Um, and uh, I'm open for questions. Yes. Yeah, so, so there was an, an active uh, uh, conversation with the Snake Camel maintainer. Uh, basically, he didn't want to make the fix. It's not that the fix was uh, like uh, he didn't know how to make it or something. It was just uh, uh, by doing this fix, it was a breaking change uh, in the library. So he didn't want to do that, and that's why he ended up doing like a Snake Camel 2.0 just because of the CV that was out. More questions? Yeah, so this is a very good question because we did think of uh, creating such a such database, but uh, it is much more difficult to to actually decide which vulnerability can you consider a shadow vulnerability. Because as you can see here, not all of the usages are actually secure the vulnerabilities. Um, so w we do think the right approach for this is just to try to choose the right tools to uh, help you mitigate such issues um, and um, I don't know like th th there is no right way to do that uh, I think we need to be more creative yeah Yeah, but uh, one of the things we're also afraid of, we, we really don't want to create more false positives. So, uh, yeah. More questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>